Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining me today to hear me talk a little bit about Horizon Discovery. Um, before I start, quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of Horizon before? Oh, not bad, good start. Okay, and how many of you are familiar with the area of gene editing? All right, so that's a good indicator of where I should start with. So our standard disclaimer, a little bit first about what we do and why we do it. That little boy on the left, his name is Noah. So Noah is a real patient. He's not an individual who just does a photograph from a stock photo. He's a real patient. And he had leukemia and was diagnosed about seven years ago with it. Now, fortunately for Noah, Noah had a type of leukemia where his specific genetics were well characterized, well understood. And then when he, when he was diagnosed, a specifically targeted therapy, therapy was able to be prescribed to him. And as a result, Noah's a cancer survivor. He's been in remission for the last five years after his treatment, that period of treatment concluded. That's why we do what we do, because Horizon builds models of disease. We let, by doing gene editing and modifying the cells, which are the smallest units of biology which you can ask complex biological questions in, you can really get to the root of what's happening in disease, why it progresses certain ways in some people, why it doesn't in others, how a therapeutic is going to impact a certain portion of the population, and how it, why it won't work in others. So that's the core of what we do. We build cells, and we do it through gene editing. Now, all that sounds complicated, but the core of it is we make basically the picks and shovels of the life sciences. We make the basic tools and the services that are now underpinning the length and breadth of the life sciences. So that's the core of it. So if you stay on that, we'll be fine. So Horizon was founded back in 2007, and we IPO'd in 2014 in March. We're listed on AIM. Um, we're a growth company. Uh, we are currently loss-making, but uh, we're driving towards profitability. And really, as I said, primarily what we do is we provide tools and services to advance the full length and breadth of life sciences, and more on that in a moment. We are covered. Um, so we're covered by Numis, RBC, and N plus one Singer. Numis and RBC are our brokers. So if you want to look at their analyst notes, you can get considerably more insight and information on the company there. I would also invite you to come and take a look at our website, especially the investor relations portion of it. Lots of good information there. All right. So Horizon is a growth story. Um, from 2007 through 2014, we had a company annual growth rate of 125% per annum. Um, in the last year, between 2014 to 2015, we've continued to grow. These are just some of the markers of growth. And I just want to draw your attention to a couple of key points. This one is the number of products in our catalog. At the end of 2014, we had just shy of 3,000. And by the end of, 2015, by the end of, that, of 2015, we had over 23,000 products in our catalog. That's really important, and you'll see why in a little while, but that engine, all of these products that we make are throwing off multiple different new revenue streams. We turn every cell we make into multiple different ways of realizing revenue and value for our customers and also ultimately value for our shareholders. And the second thing I want to draw your attention to here is our global footprint, and that's particularly relevant in the post-Brexit world. Over 90% of our revenues are not built in sterling, so we're significantly insulated from current FX effects. So here are the numbers from last year, uh, 20.2 million, which was in line with uh, consensus expectations, um, a, a EBITDA loss of 6.6 .6 million, which was a little bit better than consensus expectations. The, the expectation was around a 7.8 million loss, and cash in the bank of 25.1 million. That's important because since our, um, uh, our listing on the AIM index, We've been focused on growth and investing for scale for, uh, for the various parts of our business to position us for that period of, of acceleration. That was for 2014, 2015, 2016. We're now starting to pivot towards profitability, and we are very confident that that cash is going to see us through to the point of, um, of profitability and EBITDA positivity. So we do not anticipate needing to do any additional capital raises unless something happens, which is opportunistic. So it's entirely at our discretion. Our business is broken down into three large segments. Our products business, more detail in a moment, but very high growth rates, 124% per year, and a gross margin of 57%. Now that's continued to increase quite rapidly. Two years ago it was uh, 33%, the year after that it was in the low 40s, and it was 57% uh, last year. That's because the proportion of products where people are coming to us that are custom versus out of our catalog is continually changing, and they're very inexpensive for us to manufacture if we already have them in our catalog. Services business continues to grow. And then there's a research biotech business. That part of our business is basically using the services on, that we offer, which is all about using our models on behalf of customers, 
But what we do is instead of taking a full margin, we will get access to downstream milestones from companies like Servier or AstraZeneca or Red X Pharma. This pot is 208 million and is increased by 32% from the prior year. But that, just a word of caution on that, that is a potential milestone pot. And it's associated with drugs that are going to be launched to market potentially by these companies. And you need to look at it from a risk perspective. If we ultimately realize 10% of that, we'd be very happy. And that would be money that would go straight through to our balance sheet. All right, so what is gene editing? Easiest way to think about what gene editing is, is DNA is like string. And over time, string can knot, it can fray, it can break. And that's what causes disease. Gene editing is a way of mimicking what happens naturally in disease on demand. So what you can do is you can take cells from a person that they may have pancreatic cancer, and instead you can actually just take cells and make that exact same change on demand so you now have something that looks exactly like someone who has disease. We call these patients in a test tube, and it lets you, as I said, ask these important questions much earlier in the process. It drives down, potentially, the cost of therapeutic development. It can be applied in order to develop new therapeutic systems themselves, and also to make diagnostics more efficient. So that's the power of the models. And ultimately, what it's doing is it's underpinning the entire life sciences at this point. Back in the 1990s, action was all around DNA. The expectation was once the human genome was sequenced, that's when the panacea, it would be a panacea. All of these therapeutics would come to the market. It didn't happen. And ultimately, it didn't happen because there wasn't enough information there. Cells, however, have everything you know and everything you don't know in it. All the surprises that can come in the course of developing a therapeutic, of which 90% of that cost and a huge portion of that time is just the effect of trying to eliminate the things that aren't going to work. And if you can get that information a lot easier and a lot earlier, then a program that might take $2 billion to get a drug to market may be a fraction of that, it may be 500 million or less. That's the power when you start using these kinds of models and you put a bunch of cells together and you got organs or you have a complete organism. So we play in four different markets. Um, all together, those markets are basically the research market, the contract, so the active research market, the contract research market, the biomanufacturing market, so that is drugs that are biologics, that's sort of thing you get intravenously, the manufacturing of that, and lastly, clinical diagnostics. Put them all together, and we are in a market that's about 1.2 billion, growing at about 10 to 15% per annum, um, and we have about a 2% market share of that. The other 98% are primarily, rather than large competitors, they're poor substitutes that are in the process of being supplanted. So I'm happy to talk in detail about that, over drinks, but that's the basic situation. Gene editing, it's, you may have heard about some companies that are involved in, in the therapeutic side of it, side of things, but it's also very important on the research side. And we're not just a player in gene editing, we're arguably the global leader in it for four reasons. One, we have a very, very strong IP portfolio. The second one is that we don't just have one approach, we have multiple approaches. Sometimes it's like being a surgeon, it's great to have a scalpel, but it's also good to have clamps and a forcep and other tools depending on what sort of genome surgery you're looking to do. So having all of these different technologies places us in a really good position. It lets us do any change we want, whether it be in an immune cell or a stem cell or any other kind of cell. We also have very deep practical experience. We've actually been working in this space for a very long time, since 2007, as I said. Almost none of our competitors have that sort of breadth or depth behind them. So this is our flywheel model. I talked a moment ago about how we put assets in the bank and then spin off different revenue streams off of it. So if somebody needs a product from us and we don't already have it in our catalog, what happens is we'll make it for them and then it goes in our asset bank. From there, that customer doesn't own that. They get the license for it, they get to use it as long as they want, but it's ours. So then we can license it to more people and generate more revenue off it. We can derive it and turn it to other things. We can use it as the basis of our services. And then again, those services become the basis of a research biotech business. So our products business, just to, I'll touch on the, the different areas and the value propositions. One, we make cells. Cells are a critical component of research. We license them to pharmaceutical companies, academic researchers, and biotechnology companies. A second one is preclinical models. The way drugs are discovered and developed are in three chunks. First, you do research in cells, then you do them in preclinical models, which are animal models primarily, and then you do, them, you do the research in humans, those three different steps. So everything that we do in cells, we can also do in rodents. 
Diagnostic reference standards. If you go to a hospital, one, one challenge that happens is it's, it's poorly recognized that upwards of 30% of the time on a genetic test, that result that's gonna be provided will be incorrect. So that means if you are being, you could be, um, a, a physician might be trying to decide whether or not to give you a therapeutic which could extend your life or could be uh, very impactful for the disease you have and they may decide to or not to give that drug based upon the results of that diagnostic test. But a significant portion of the time they're wrong. The reason is controls for these tests, the target you aim for, it's not, they're, they're very, very poor. So by using, again, these very same assets, these very same cells, we're mimicking real patient samples and providing those to large diagnostic companies and to individual uh, hospital labs as well. And then the last side is the biomanufacturing. The manu so we make cells that are little factories for making biologic drugs, and then we provide them to big companies like Lonza or pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer, uh, so that, or biosimilars manufacturers where the generics manufacturers in places like India. So this is a very exciting part of our business, very high revenue, very high margin. The services part of our business, it's all about applying all of these models I've already described. It comes in three different types. One, if somebody wants a model we don't already have, we'll make it for them. Second, if somebody wants us to do the tests or do assays for them, we'll do it for them and we'll just provide them with data. And the third way is that identifying genes that are associated with specific forms of disease, we're very good at helping with that as well. And then there's our research biotechnology part of our business. So this is, there's two different parts to that. As I mentioned, I'll, I'll pause on it a little bit. So some of our services, if there's an, a really exciting compound that we've worked with, for example, with some survey, and that's one of our press releases, you can take a look at that, Red X is another. Sometimes we won't take our full margin for the services that we provide. Sometimes we'll just cover our costs, so we're always in a block and a deal. But in return for that, we'll get access to downstream milestones or revenue if that product ultimately comes to market. That's one half of a research project. The second half is this. So we've ring-fenced 10 million pounds, and it's basically a small investment fund. And because of the technology we have, the expertise, the capabilities, the IP, all of that, we're very confident that there are specific areas of drug development that we can get involved in that would, in a three-year period of time or so, so a limited time frame with a limited amount of investment, advance programs. And by doing that, it exposes our investors to the upside of therapeutics. So therapeutic investment is risky. That's your standard biotech model. Um, for every 10 you may try to invest in, seven of them ultimately aren't going to realize anything, two of them might, and one of them there's, hopefully will become a blockbuster. We're trying to change that model a little bit, and we're also trying to access that blockbuster model, or at least some of the some high revenue potential for our customers, but in a risk managed way. So we only do it in very, three very specific areas. One is immuno-oncology. The idea here is that cancer is extremely good at hiding from the immune system. What we do, and what other companies that are quite highly valued, especially in the US, have done, is trying to shine a light on the cancer so that your immune system can actually go after it. There's nothing better than your immune system for actually fighting disease, so it actually turns it back on. So we have an investment in that. It's a JV, um, where we have put up to five million pounds aside for that in two tranches. So that's a three-year program, and we'll be probably doing an announcement or an update on that in February, which is upon the one-year anniversary. This one, all I'm going to say about that one, technology-wise, is that sometimes when you have a genetic disease, it creates an Achilles heel somewhere else, and you can go after that to try to build a drug. And so when you build that drug, you highlight or you start printing opportunities to go after diseases that there may not be treatments for. We have a large partnership with AstraZeneca in this particular area. And the third one, and we haven't announced anything in this area yet, but it's high interest, is cell therapy. And the idea there is taking cells from a person, fixing them with gene editing, and putting them back in the individual. And because they're your own cells, there's no risk of rejection. So very powerful. So I talked about the flywheel. I talked about how we can recognize revenue in a lot of different ways. This is a story which brings it all together, hopefully. So back in 2007 through 2009, uh, there was a research consortia called Coltheris. I didn't know about it. But Horizon, because we're on the cutting edge of science in this area, we're involved in a lot of research groups where in, uh, private companies, research institutes, et cetera, all, all to come together. This one was around different forms of cancer, including colorectal cancer. In the course of that work, they identified a gene that 
is involved with a lot of different cancers, and if you have changes in this gene, you are not going to react at all to the leading therapeutic. That was a big deal because the FDA and EMEA were going to change the label on that drug. So what happened is there's a small diagnostics company outside of Birmingham called DXS Diagnostics that came to Horizon and said, could you make a cell for each of the different changes that can happen in this gene? So great, we said we made it. And off they went, they paid us 500,000 pounds for that. And we owned the cell line. And that's the important point. Again, we always own the work we do. Those cell lines after that, we can continue and did continue to license them out to academics, pharmaceutical companies, biotechnology companies. And since 2009, when this deal came through, we've realized over another million pounds from that, from additional licensing. We've also turned them into reference standards. I talked about how it's using cells to mimic real patients' samples so that you can use that to make diagnostic testing better. Same thing. And we're looking at taking those cells and putting them in the kit so, so that our, the vendors we're working with will use their commercialization channel to go out broadly and generate revenue for us. We've also used those, those cells, those same products, as the basis of a wide range of services. Again, another over a million pounds from that. And then lastly, there, those cells were part of our research biotech business. So hopefully what you can see is this model where customer comes to us, asks us to make something. We make that thing and it goes into our asset bank. Once it's in the asset bank, we can continue to sell it as is to customers or license it as is to other customers, turn it into new things like the molecular reference standards, use them as a basis of a wide range of services that are high value and high margin for the company, use that as the basis for our research biotechnology part of our business, which ultimately is designed to try to get you and our other shareholders access to the upside potential of therapeutic development. So what to expect from Horizon in, in the rest of 2016 through 2017? Obviously, we're focused on growth, so we're continuing to drive core revenue growth across all of our businesses. Accelerated growth primarily has been around the space of M&A up to this point. When we IPO'd back in 2014, we did so on the premise of there were specific areas we wanted to invest in and add capability. We did three M&A acquisitions. All of those are complete. All of those are fully integrated. At this point, we don't feel we need to do any additional M&A. Um, which is not to say we wouldn't, but it would have to be something accretive and interesting that would come across our, our paths. But we do actively look for in-licensing. And increasing the value of what we do in scientific leadership, these are all about staying on the forefront of science and also being directed and guided by our scientific advisory board, by our customers, um, and by our board to make sure that we're always in the right spaces like immuno-oncology and others to provide the greatest value possible. So our infrastructure is in place, the acquisitions are done and integrated, or we're on a great trajectory. Um, we have a good plan to try to get some additional value through to our, to our investors through the research biotech portfolio, and now we're pivoting and driving towards the path to profit. We're confident that we have sufficient cash in the bank to do so as it currently stands.